Hello, booktube. I don't know how well this is going to work. I'm filming on yet another piece of technology, but I had no choice because it has happened again. I had a peaceful interlude. I transferred to a school upstate where there was no bullying. Uh, but as is often the case, my bully followed me. Aaron Facer did another shelf tour in his library tour uh, and taunted me on one of our shirtless Skype sessions, saying that I was a soy cook. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound like much of an insult because I do enjoy cooking soy. But he didn't mean cook. He just pronounces it that way. Uh, so I am back to doing a library tour. I have no idea how this is going to work. The last bit of the library tour that we did was a wall of bookshelves in the kitchen. Now, they may have been a mess on their own. They weren't organized in any way, but at least it was just a wall of bookcases. Now we have to deal with all sorts of different terrain, uh, including the depths of Mordor, the hutch that is built into the wall of the living room. Uh, and that because it's built into the wall of the living room tends to act as one of those dreaded catch-alls for all kinds of books. Uh, so we're going to do some of this anyway. I don't know, I don't know how much of it we can do. Uh, quite a bit of this is graphic novels, and I know that that will reduce the already minimal interest in these library tours to two or three people. Uh, but there is a shelf of books. I dread what they are. They won't be organized in any way, but we'll give them a try here. Uh, so what, what's this first one here? Okay, this is a nature classic. This is uh, Fred Bodsworth's classic, The Last of the Curlews. Uh, which has this uh, photographic cover, but it's full of spot illustrations. Just full of lovely spot illustrations that are um, by T.M. Short. And I'm sorry for you, you Florida residents there that I opened it on a shark. Uh, we've had some shark activity here in the United States just recently. This is a nature classic. It's all by itself up here, but it is, it is a classic of nature. Uh, okay, then we have another volume in this lovely series. This is Britain in Pictures. These were thin hardcovers that just take you through the history of, uh, through illustrations, the history of some certain British subject. Uh, and this is British Dogs. This will, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. This will take you through famous paintings. Uh, of course, Sir Edwin Landseer. You've got lots of other stuff in here as well, though, all sorts of historical sketches. I have a few of those, they all ought to be together, or the British dogs ought to be with all the other dog books, uh, but, <laughs> uh, okay, then we have a book from, uh, oh god, when was this? This was uh, 2019. Uh, this is by, uh, it's uh, edited by Bandy Lee, Dr. Bandy Lee, and it is The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump full of clippings, where a bunch of psychiatrists and psychologists diagnose Donald Trump from afar, uh, breaking thereby the informal procedure known as the Goldwater Rule that says you cannot diagnose a patient unless you've actually met them, unless you've had sessions with them. All of these professionals know that. None of these professionals do that lightly. All of them say this is a, the most public person in the world uh, who never has a thought that he doesn't speak. So although we are not using these as bindingly clinical diagnoses, we think we are willing to stand by them. Of course, every, this was 2019, every single call that these professionals made of a psychological nature, not necessarily a physical nature, but every single call they made of psychological nature has gone on to be resoundingly uh, verified in the last five years. If anything, they were pulling their punches here. Uh, it's grim reading. I occasionally go back to it. It's uh, in just a few months, just eight, nine months, the presence of that book on my shelf will be one of the things that gets me interned. Uh, but I, I like it and I'm not going to start throwing away books in that eventuality. So, okay, then we have, uh, well, these aren't organized in any way. Then we have uh, Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg. These are two books, uh, The Beginning of Desire and Reflection, and, and oh no, these are both the beginning of desire these are two different copies of the beginning of desire uh by this author why i have two copies of this book i don't know i obviously prefer uh the one with the water uh, over this one no idea why i have both of these uh but here let's put the double aside i certainly don't need doubles of it i love it though it's it's uh biblical as jesus it's beautifully poetically done 
Uh, okay, then we have a trade paperback of Paul Anderson's The Boat of a Million Years. This is science fiction. We already went through a block of science fiction. This should not be here. Obviously, it, all of its confederates are elsewhere. So let's set it aside, put it with them. Uh, it's a generation ship novel, sci hard science fiction, very, very good. Uh, okay, then we have a literary study. Uh, this is a literary study of the works of Boccaccio. I don't really have a home for this. I guess it would go in the... I have a literary bookcase. I, it would more likely go there than it would go here. Uh, it, it takes Boccaccio seriously, which is uh, very, very nice. Doesn't always happen. Doesn't happen nearly as often as you'd think. Oh, okay. Uh, then we have the, uh, the, the biography of Junius Wilson uh, by Susan Birch and someone named Hannah Joyner. <laughs> right there on the shelf. Obviously, this does not belong here. This belongs in the biography section. Uh, from 2018, we have Roberto Saviano's book, The Piranhas, uh, about teenage gangsters, real-life teenage gangsters. And uh, this is a novel, but he made his bones, he made his spurs in the writing world by uh, writing about organized crime nonfiction and has had a few attempts made on his life. This is gripping, gripping stuff about teenage boys growing up in a world that most ordinary people would not even recognize. It's not even a question of can we arrest them and get them out of that world and then rehabilitate them. It's not even a question of that. They are, they have never known anything like the world that we live in. So you wouldn't be able to rehabilitate them. They would be play acting the whole time. If you asked them, if you told them, I want you, we're going to have you live now in a world where you don't resolve any arguments or conflicts with violence. It's not you, that you don't reserve, resolve some of them that way. You're not going to be able to resolve any of them that way. You're not going to use violence at all. They wouldn't even understand the language you were speaking. They wouldn't understand the individual words that you were speaking. Uh, I don't know what happens to any of these. I guess all of these, these teenage gangsters get killed. I'm assuming they all do. Uh, okay, then we have something for the gays. We have a section for this, though. This is edited by Mark Mitchell and David Levitt. This is a great anthology, Pages Passed from Hand to Hand, an anthology of gay literature in the United States, especially during the, the centuries when it could not speak its name, when it had to be encoded uh, in other things. So I'm going to put that, I'm going to leave that here and put it with the other books uh, for the gays. Well, then we have something from 2020. This is Bart Gelman's book, Dark Mirror. Uh, about Edward Snowden. I have a couple of books on Edward Snowden, and I, I find him fascinating to, to read about. The, uh, the rather caustic, hardline stance that I took on him back when he committed his crimes and fled the United States uh, has largely been, I think, vindicated in the years since. He is now a, a proud, happy citizen of Russia, and un unquestionably a traitor to the United States, to his homeland. Uh, so, and, and that was, that for a very, for a long time after he fled the country, that was a very déclassé thing to say, much less to include in a review, which I did a couple of times. Uh, a very good book, but I don't know what's on the shelf. I don't know what belongs here and what doesn't. Uh, okay, then we have, oh my, all right, I don't have many of these things. This is another Trump book. Uh, this is from 2019. This is by Dale Barron, and it's called It Came From Something Awful, How a Toxic Troll Army Accidentally Memed Donald Trump Into Office. So this is one of the last books that could be written about Trump in anything like a jocular manner. This is one of the last books that was written where it could be that he was just some sort of freak show, and obviously he's a buffoon, obviously he's a moron, and obviously his followers are morons, the, the people who believe in Donald Trump are the stupid people in America. Uh, but it's all kind of funny. Yes, it was a fluke. We have to put up with this weirdo with his fake hair and his, his lies about literally everything, even including how tall he is. Uh, we have to put up with him, but he'll never be reelected and it won't matter at all. You can't write books like this anymore. Uh, it was around this time and only a little bit after it that it became pretty obvious that Donald Trump and especially the mobsters that he has around him are an existential threat to American democracy. It's not just that they don't particularly like the unpredictability of democracy. It's that they don't like democracy. And most of them have come out and said that, that they don't want it. They would like to scrap it in, in, in favor of something older, 
and more predictable. Uh, and when this book came out, we had no idea that they would actually attempt that, that Donald Trump would launch an armed insurrection to overthrow the government. So pretty tough to reread something like this innocently. I don't know that I could. Uh, okay, then we have uh, somebody else's copy of Austerlitz by W.G. Sebald. Uh, I, so the reason I know it's somebody else is because they, like me, put all sorts of clippings in their books, but I didn't do that. Uh, this book came out and was celebrated, this author was celebrated at a time when I didn't see what the fuss was. I didn't like him at all. And I don't quite like him still. Uh, but one of you, years and years ago, suggested that this book might be the thing, that if any book is going to do it, this book might be the thing to domesticate him in my mind, to get me to understand what wavelength he's on, and it kind of sort of did. Uh, so I, I held on to it, and I reread. I read all of the uh, the reviews by the critics in there. Uh, okay, then we have another uh, Britain in pictures. This is English Country Houses by Vita Sackville West. Of course, I'm going to have this volume since I have a, a deep interest in English Country Houses. Uh, but it's it's floating free away from the book on dogs, <laughs> much less all the others. I think we covered a book on canals a long time ago on this channel. Uh, Okay, we have uh, Henry Morgan and George Booth. This is their book on dogs. Uh, George Booth is a famous New Yorker cartoonist. And this is just about various dogs. It's humorous stories about various breeds or various roles that dogs play, plus Booth's illustrations. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, we have James Connolly's book, Seaborn, 30 Years of Voyaging. Nice old vintage paperback here from look at that, the different knots that you can use, uh, from the 1940s, is that right? When did you come out? This is definitely rationing paper. Uh, yeah, 1944. Uh, terrific story, but it doesn't, well, none of these things belong here, so I guess that's understood. Uh, we have uh, one of the Object Lessons books from Bloomsbury. This is Space Rover. This is the finished copy that has the French flaps, and this is about all of these valiant little machines there are a lot of them are still working they're still moving around they're still taking measurements i don't know how many of you saw the clip that went viral just a couple of days ago of uh, a glimpse of mars from the curiosity rover that included audio unbelievable just if you can find it quiet everything else in your life and just listen to what the wind on mars sounds like it's just incredible uh Okay, so there's that one. Then we have uh, Louise Dickinson Rich's book, The Forest Years, which is her, it, this is a, an, uh, an anthology volume also from the 1940s, I believe. Uh, yeah, 1942. Uh, this is an anthology volume of uh, My Neck of the Woods and her breakout hit, We Took to the Woods. And this, they are, here they are in one volume. Uh, delicious, wonderfully friendly stuff. Uh, we have... Uh, an architectural guide to Venice that has schmutz on it that I don't know can be cleaned off. This is just building by building, uh, whatever historical tidbit you can get from each of the buildings. I uh, have different technology in a different location, but we still have to pause for the sirens. Because they don't pause. Uh, okay, then from 2020, four years ago, we have a collection of stories called Cool for America by someone named Andrew Martin. Uh, very, very hep cat, cutting edge, I'm just gonna stop, I'm not gonna end my story's fiction, but nevertheless showing glimmers of promise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> from Scholastic, these are only, I only have a few Scholastic books. All the American viewers of this channel love Scholastic. I only have a few of these that aren't kids' books. I guess these are kids' books. Uh, these are from an old TV show called Max Steel. Uh, there's going turbo <laughs> and taking it to the max. Uh, these don't have pictures, I don't believe. Uh, no, they don't have they don't have pictures. But they, this was a weird show. It was done with a weird kind of animation that wasn't quite cartoons, wasn't quite uh, CGI. It was weird, and I don't know what's become of Max Steel. No idea if you can see it on YouTube. I should look and see. Uh, I did. A, fic a fan fiction story of Max Steele. I put it up on fanfiction.net or somewhere. It's one of those sites from the late, you know, the, the late 2000s. Uh, because in the show, Max Steele is a, a, you know, a gorgeous himbo who is 
infected with, he has nanobots running throughout his body that allow him to be briefly superpowered. Uh, and the tech kid, the Hispanic tech kid, who is right shotgun on, on his nanotechnology and is the exposition dumper for every episode. I, I watched all of the Max Steel episodes and it's so clear that the kid is in love with him that I wrote a fan fiction story in which that is the case. Um, but Lord knows where that is. I have no idea where that is. Uh, then we have a mystery novel, Hamlet Revenge by Michael Inns. Uh, terrific stuff in this old, this is a trade paperback of this old Penguin crime line. I have a lot of these in mass market. I think this might be my only one in trade paperback. Uh, we have Mike Bartlett's play, King Charles III. This was a play, it was a hit in London before the reality, before King Charles became king. Uh, it's really, really good. And I, I, I don't travel anymore. My traveling days are over. Uh, but I envy the people who could who could have gone to see. I think it was Timothy Pickett Smith as the king in this. I envy the people who could have gone to see those performances. I wish I could have seen the stage version of it. Uh, we have another murder mystery. Uh, this is Francine Matthews. This is Death on Nantucket. Just a, a classic murder mystery set on an island off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, we have another dog book here. This is oh no, this is Edward Gorey. This is uh, the Doubtful Guest. These little uh, Edward Gorey stories that were done in these rectangular hardcovers. I used to have all of them. I now have only that one. Uh, we have Co or A Season on Earth, which would easily work for Summer of Sport. This is an epic poem about a baseball player. <laughs> Among many other things, it takes all sorts of twists and turns, but it is it is also about a baseball player, and it's, it's delightful. When did this come out? 1959. Uh, and I have this paperback that really won't stand a reread. Uh, we have a play, Peter Schaefer, Amadeus. Uh, probably I got this uh, right around the time that the movie was in the theaters, 1985 or something like that. Uh, the play is terrific, of course. The movie is also terrific. Uh, okay, we have a graphic novel. This is Crying Freeman. Uh, one of the only manga that I have in my collection. This is Abduction in Chinatown. Uh, these came out as little... Uh, individual graphic novels chapter by chapter and then they were put together in these anthology volumes uh, this hyper realistic photo realistic artwork they were put together in these anthology volumes I think to coincide with this movie which nobody watched uh, and I only have this one I only have the one volume I don't I don't know how much crying Freeman I have I read all of it I read it from the beginning all the way to the end uh, the, the little old lady who ran the, the what was going to become a comic shop, she didn't know that at the time, they didn't exist at the time, but she ran a shop that was going to become a comic shop. She used to sit there all day. Her son wanted to open the shop and he couldn't make a go of it, so she did. She said, well, I'm not going to let all this go to waste, I'll do it myself. How hard can it be? Uh, and she used to read everything. She used to sit there all day and read everything. The shop had a terrible location. You had to go hunting for it to find it. And no one went hunting for it, except me. <laughs> and she told me. You ought to read this. It's not superheroes, but it's really good. Uh, okay, then we have an anthology volume, Richard Ford. This is the Granta book of the American short story, his second bite at the apple of uh, the Granta short story collection. This is a terrific anthology, really, really good. Actually belongs in the little book room. Uh, I don't know if I should set it aside for that. <laughs> uh, we have another anthology. This is edited by Philip Kerr. This is the Penguin Book of Lies. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, which is full of deceitful stories, but also stories about lying. Uh, we have uh, another anthology. This is edited by Gerald Gross. This is Editors on Editing. All sorts of stories, horror stories, war stories about editors and their various anthologies and various ex exploits in various newsrooms. Oh, well, here's that Andrew Martin person again. This is early work, his debut novel. Uh, so this had to go with Cool for America. Let's put those together at least. Yes, they, they belong in a bookcase with fiction, but they at least belong together. Uh, we have a booktube book, Horror Tube. This is Local Haunts, uh, a collection of a couple of dozen uh, horror anthology, horror short stories from a whole bunch of well-known booktubers. Uh, we have one of these old vintage contemporary paperbacks. God, I wish I had all of these things. I'd love to give them all a reread. They're probably intensely collectible. I have this one, Mohawk, by Richard Russo, which is also a debut novel, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, so that's early work and 
Mohawk. Those are two debut novels, two American debut novels. Uh, we have a paperback of Susan Sontag regarding the pain of others. Thin Little Thing, her meditation on pain. We have a Penguin Modern classic of Frederick Manning's book, The Middle Parts of Fortune. Terrific war novel, terrifically subversive war novel. I've had this in a number of different editions. Uh, we have Europa editions. This is Old Filth uh, by Jane Gardam. This is a terrific novel, just a terrific. So glad I have a copy. So many Europa paperbacks, so many of their books that I wish I had and don't. Uh, we have A.J. Languth is next. He's a historian that I really like. I've recommended his book Patriots about the American Revolution to so many of you, just so many of you. But also his book Noise of War about the Roman Revolution of, of you know, Pompey and Crassus and Julius Caesar. This is something completely different. This is a novel of his called Three Christs. Uh, uh, New Testament fiction that didn't work for me at all. Uh, it was kind of rare for an author like that, for that to happen. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay, this is from 2020. This is Lost Companions, uh, a book about the death of pets uh, that I got and read. I couldn't review it. I, I, I just... It, the idea of reviewing it, I think I eventually did write about it for somebody, but my, the idea of writing about it was so hard. I have been through this so many times. This exact thing. These exact reflections. I'm hopefully a long way off from it right now. Uh, this is a rare instance in my life where I have only one dog, and she's at the pinnacle of her youth and strength. So I'm hoping that I'm at least a decade off from this, but still, this brought back so many memories. <laughs> so many times I have been through uh, that very thing. Uh, what have we got next here? Another Penguin Modern Classic? Yes, this is Exile's Return, Malcolm Cowley. This does not belong here, uh, that's for sure. This is, belongs with, over with the, uh, the literary books on the other side of the room. But if I put it over there and forget about it, am I going to do it again for another, for another book haul? Uh, <laughs> okay, we have a privately read, privately made thing here from 2008. This is a children's picture book called Red. <laughs> and that's all it is, is just an introduction to this little dog named Red, uh, with an inscription there from uh, the author. Uh, the author just had this privately made, it's, it doesn't have an ISBN, it was never for sale, but uh, this was a customer at my bookstore. In the, the very last few years that I was working in a retail bookstore, this woman would come in and Red was on her shoulder all the time, and he and I, <laughs> we got to know each other very, very well. Uh, he was more or less friendly, but with me, <laughs> he was he was a nuclear explosion. It was incredible. He couldn't wait to smooch me all over my face, and I couldn't wait to smooch him. His owner used to say, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> he sure likes you. Uh, and so I was, I was overjoyed and completely honored when she gave me a copy of that book. I don't know how many copies of it exist. Uh, okay, then we have John Buchan. This is the, the complete Richard Hanai stories in... Uh, this old, what are these called? The Wordsworth paperbacks? I don't have many of these Wordsworth paperbacks, but I really kind of liked this one for some reason. The, the cover illustration, the stock cover illustration there, made Richard Hanna, who's was the operative in all of these novels, into a bell-bottom wearing super hottie in his early 20s. I don't understand the reasoning, but Steve can live with that. <laughs> and these stories are just so good. They're just so good. Uh, then we have uh, Modern Library. This is a, a trade paperback of Richard Kipling's Kim with an introduction by Pankaj Mishra. It's a, just a wonderful edition of this novel. I think it's the only edition of Kim that I have. It doesn't belong out here. It belongs in the little book room, of course. So does the Rosh Hanai books. Uh, let's see. We're almost at the end here. Oh, okay. I kept this. I don't know why. This is from 2021. This is Peter Mendelssohn's book, The Delivery. I don't know why I kept this. It infuriated the life out of me. Uh, it's a story of a hapless delivery boy in an unnamed city who is just making deliveries all day long. The first half of the book is just horror stories from all of his different runs. Never knows what he's going to find when he opens the door to deliver his whatever someone wants to deliver. He works for a, a loudish dispatcher and he's in love with the girl who sends him out on his runs. And fine, okay. But then something else happens. The second half of the book happens, and especially the ending, the last page of the book happens, that throws all of that all out the window. And I, it was just incredibly frustrating because there was no way for me to tell anyone that without spoiling the book. Uh, because it's the literal ending of the book and it's a twist ending. So there's no way for me to do that 
There's no way for me to let the reader know that when you finish this book, you're going to wish you hadn't read it. Um, but that that appears to be it. The only other thing up here is uh, an issue of Analog from 2023, which certainly does not belong up here, right? It's not even a book. So it belongs somewhere else. Let's put that somewhere else. So there you go. That is that is this shelf. <laughs> that is. I don't know what to do with it now that I've done it. Now that I've, I've toured you through it, I have to do something with these things. No idea what I'm going to do with it. It's Aaron's fault. I'll find something. I'll, I will repatriate as many of these as I can and just leave empty space. Uh, but anyway, I'll wrap this up for now. I don't know how I will do any more bookshelves in this hutch. I don't think it's possible. Uh, but I'll give it a try. I'll work out some logistics, and you'll be the first to know. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.